Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of Superhero Ethics. If you've listened to many of our episodes, especially any that we talked about Batman, you know that Kevin Conroy was someone we truly cherished as one of, if not our favorite portrayal of Batman. Well, unfortunately, recently he passed away and... Paul and I decided to do a small mini episode just to kind of honor and tribute and talk about why his contributions to Batman have been so important. And we couldn't really do that without bringing in DC superfan uh, Jess Plummer, because I found this is the one time I can get her to say good things about a Batman portrayal. So, um, you know, even though Superman's great, too, today we're going to be talking about Batman and Kevin Conroy in this little mini episode. So thank you so much. And we'll be right back after this commercial break that I would like to be from Wayne Enterprises, but we'll see. Welcome back. This is Matthew, your host. I am joined, as almost always, by definitely not a host, Mr. Paul Hobby. <laughs> Paul, how are we doing today? Um, yeah, I mean, overall, doing pretty good. You know, bummed on the, the current topic, of course. For sure. For sure. And Jess, as I said, you're recurring. I'm so glad you could be with us because I know this was a topic that uh, was really important to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I would echo Paul that I am I am real bummed. It's very sad. I wish we didn't have to record it, but I'm glad I'm recording it with you too. For sure. Ditto. And so Jess, let's start with you because I know we've joked about how Batman isn't your favorite. You're more a Superman woman, but that you really do uh, love all the DC stuff. And, you know, I know you mentioned that you were really affected by uh, Kevin Conroy's passing. So talk a little bit about what this, what uh, his portrayal of Batman meant to you. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I was surprised by how much it affected me. Um, like you said, I am definitely more of a Superman fan in general. Um, and honestly, like even though the uh, Batman, the animated series, which was uh, Kevin Conroy's first time in the role, um, premiered in 1992 when I was math eight. <laughs> <laughs> um so he's basically been Batman my whole life. Like he's been Batman mm. since I knew what Batman was, but I didn't actually like superheroes as a kid. And I was like, if I turned on the TV and it was a superhero cartoon, I'd be offended because to me, cartoons were about like, you know, somebody hitting somebody else in the face with a pie, um, <laughs> which, right. you know, wasn't really happening in Batman. I guess the Joker would do it, but it'd be a murder pie and it doesn't have the same <laughs> spirit. Um, not not quite like a Sylvester and Tweety Bird. No, exactly. And so I'd always be like, ugh, and change the channel and go find DuckTales or something. But when I got into comics and superheroes um, in high school and college, it was really like Batman the Animated Series was, as it is for so many people, a jumping off point for me, even though, of course, it had been off the air for a very long time. Justice League was on the air, um, and that, you know, again, had Kevin Conroy as Batman, and... Um, and I have since gone back and watched it. I was literally watching it like Thursday night and then checked Twitter on Friday morning and he had passed. Like, mm. even though I didn't grow up with it, I still feel like I grew up with it because it was always there and he was always there. Um, yeah, no, I, I, like I said, I was surprised by how much it affected me, um, but I, Cried a lot. May cry in this episode. No promises. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, it's an emotional topic. Paul, what about for you? Because I know um, I certainly remember the animated series being a big part of like my high school years. I didn't watch it much myself at that point, but a lot of my friends did uh, in our mutual friend circle. It was talked about a lot. Were you watching it as it was coming out or do you not get into it later? Yeah, I didn't really watch the animated series when it was out. I was aware of it and, you know, I might have seen a bit of it here and there. I actually grew up a, a Superman kid, you know. Um, the Su Superman 1 and 2 came out either just before I was born, the first one, or like when I was very little. Um you know, I mean, I <laughs> I had my hair done by uh, one of the, the, the village people's boyfriends <laughs> with, like, the little curl and everything when I was, like, four or five. Um, That's awesome. And, like, went to school in, like, a full, like, Superman outfit and <laughs> was um, – and actually got to, meet, uh, got to meet Christopher Reeves. Um, 
when my dad worked on a, a movie with him, the Bostonians, um, and, and played volleyball with him, actually, which was really <laughs> funny. Um, oh, which also then, you know, becomes a stat- sad story with um, how his life ended, um, mm-hmm. you know, too soon. Uh, I, I could be talking about Christopher or my dad, actually. But um, that sort of, you know, then Batman, the the movies with, um, you know, the Tim Burton movies with, with Michael Keaton came out. And that was kind of when I became more of a Batman fan. But it mm-hmm. wasn't really until like the 2000s that – I started getting like really interested in it again. And, um, it was, it was the Justice League series, actually. Like I was aware of the animated series, uh, but I, I didn't watch it regularly or anything. And then I just, I watched the entirety of the Justice League series probably in like two or three weeks or something, you know, mm-hmm. and it was just so good. And to me, um, you know, it's a combination, it's a combination of the writing. And the voice acting, right? Which I think anytime you get really like a just a, a peak level performance, it always has to be some combination of those, I think. And sure. and so I think, you know, Kevin Conroy was was fortunate to get this role that was just really well written and you know, he he was given kind of to me the Batman who is like the best Batman that there can be, you know? Yeah. But then for all of those, you know, my favorite moments of those to be on the level they were, it required his performance to like, to make it real. Right. And, yeah. um, somehow, you know, his Batman felt more real to me than any of the, you know, gritty live action takes that, uh, many of which I love, but, mm-hmm. There's just something uh, that feels so real, like, you know, human or just like a like a person, you know, and I think mm-hmm. he captured the the essence of both Bruce Wayne and Batman and really distinguished them with his voice. Right. Like you can tell whether this is Bruce Wayne or Batman speaking without looking at the screen. And right. I think that was something that he just did so well. And, um, you know, he just delivered so many fantastic lines, particularly as Batman, I'd say more than as Bruce. Um, but there's, there's some more, you know, Bruce Wayne lines that I, I think were just fantastic. And, and the way he differentiated those two, uh, I think is like essential to, the Batman character and he does it in a way without going like full Christian Bale. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. I, I want to talk about my own story with, with Batman, but I'll just say, and I've said this before on the, on the show, but I think it's worth repeating. One of my favorite comments about Batman and it, it, it comes from the, the folks at the DC on screen podcast. And it's that unlike most superheroes, with Batman, Batman is who he is. And Bruce Wayne is the like, persona that he puts on but the core identity is batman and and when they were uh talking about that they said that that it, it was batman the animated series and kevin conroy who really most uh you know gave them that idea and i definitely think that that felt true because i think you're right the bruce his bruce always feels like not that it's a struggle but that it like it, it and it doesn't feel like it's bad acting at all it feels like the actor is very suited to it but he's portraying it as someone who is always a little bit uncomfortable in his own skin and i just always feel like so much more assurance when he is in actually being when he's uh, acting as batman instead because, because what he's portraying is that bruce wayne is someone who's always like a little bit putting on this show for everybody even Less so when he's talking with Alfred, but even there, like just he as Batman is when he's most comfortable. Yeah, I think to some extent there's almost three roles there where there's Mm -hmm. Bruce Wayne, the performance in front of, you know, a a crowd. There's Batman, which, you know, you could say is, is the true identity. And then there's Bruce Wayne in Wayne Manor where only Alfred's around and he's, you know, the question is like, do you have to always pretend you're Bruce when you're like not in the Batcave? And then when you're in the Batcave, you could be Batman or, you know, do you have this kind of in between? 
Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking. I was, I was thinking that as I was saying it because, yeah, like, I would like to say that no, he's just Batman with Alfred. But I think one of the really beautiful parts of that relationship is that Alfred knows that Batman is kind of his core. But kind of one of Alfred's main goals throughout the entire show is to allow him to become Bruce again. You know, going to help mm. him out of just being Batman. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, you know, I've, there have been a lot of clips that are have been circulating since the news broke that he passed. And also I've, been, I've you know, continued to rewatch the show. Um, and I absolutely agree with both of you that there's sort of those three, like, major categories. But the thing that I think was so... Um, one of the many things that was so powerful about his performance was how sort of he could flow in between them and he was very mutable. It's sort of like, you know, to go back to Christopher Reeve, watching him, you know, straighten up and turn into Superman and then hunch his shoulders and turn into Clark and you see the way he does it. You can hear the way Kevin Conroy does it. And yeah. like, and there is, I was watching the, the two part, um, Ra's al Ghul episode, um, and there's like a scene where he and Robin are like lost in the desert and then they find their way to like a Wayne Enterprises building <laughs> in whatever country that they're in, which is very funny. And they're like change into like their usual, like he's got his turtleneck on and Dick has his little sweater vest. And I'm like, do you just keep those <laughs> in all of your offices? <laughs> um, but he's, so they're like talking about like what they're going to do next, but it's Bruce. Like he's wearing civilian clothing, but he's using a voice that's much closer to Batman, but because he's talking mm. to Dick, who's his partner right. and his kid, it's very, it's a very warm version of it. They're like joking around with each other. It's not the way that he talks to like Roz and Talia. And then one of the um, clips that was circulating on Twitter um, was from mask of the phantasm. When Bruce breaks down uh, in the rain at his parents' grave. And the person who tweeted it said that Kevin Conroy was particularly proud of that particular scene, which they, they might have been making up. I don't know, but he should have been proud because it's it's amazing. Um, yeah. But he's fully in the Bruce voice, which really surprised me because I would... Because I, I default as well to thinking that the Batman voice is more true to who he is, but it makes sense that he wouldn't talk to his parents that way like, right yeah it makes total sense that he's in that higher register that he's because he's so vulnerable in that moment and it was such a it's such a smart choice as an actor and it's a choice that shows that he how well he knew and understood the character absolutely and and i think he's using kind of more of like a young bruce voice there right mm -hmm. than like yeah. fake bruce Yes, yeah, it doesn't yeah. have that um, that little veneer of I'm a doofus <laughs> that right. he usually yeah, does yeah. as Bruce, which I love. He's so good yeah, at it's Bruce. Great. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think definitely with some of those other portrayals, like Christian Bale and things like that, who I utterly love, yeah, it does feel like almost the portrayal of Bruce is almost to a comical extent. Whereas with Kevin, while I do feel like he, and in Batman the Animated Series and the games and all that, while I do feel like Batman is the core identity – that tension is still always there. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't feel like Alfred is, tr you know, barking up a, a, the wrong tree or whatever metaphor you want to use for hopelessness. Like Alfred sees that there is the part of him that still is that side of him and all that. And, and just because we keep mentioning it, I didn't get a chance to see before my own quick Christopher Reeve story. Uh, I'm about the same age as Paul. We didn't know each other back then, but um, I got to say very proudly when I was in nursing school or kindergarten that my daddy sued Superman <laughs> um, because uh, Christopher Reeves owned the top floor of a co-op building. He wanted to do some construction in the building he didn't want him to do. My father wound up representing the building and so bringing a lawsuit against Christopher Reeves. Um, but, but yeah. Uh, well, sorry, it's, it's just funny that Christopher Reeves keeps coming up because um, they went to Juilliard together. Um, oh yeah. Really? Yeah, I was I have doing no idea. Yeah, I I I wrote um an obituary for Kevin Conroy um for Book Riot which is, is going to go up at some point this week. I'm not sure what day. Um and so I did a little bit of research and I was reading like various like the Warner Brothers press release about his passing. Um but he studied at Juilliard with a whole host of, you know, well-known actors including Christopher Reeve and Robin Williams who was yeah. his roommate. And I just looked at those three names and I was like wow. <laughs> like the, it's the saddest list. Like they were all so mm -hmm. talented, they were all so by all accounts wonderful people and they're all gone far too soon and it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. 
and there's something really beautiful about that they all went to Juilliard because I'm going to talk about the way this is often conceived and acknowledging that there's some problematic classist ideas in this. But like, I think often we think of like, oh, you know, Juilliard or Yale or Dramatory, like that's where like the real actors go, you know, and that those people then go on to do Shakespeare and like the serious acting. And so knowing that these three went on to do, you know, stand up comedy and then a lot of like comedic movies, although they often had a lot of very serious acting in them. And then the other two were primarily superhero actors for most of their life, one on voice, one on screen. It's kind of hilarious, but it's also really telling about how we can often really under undervalue the the talent that goes into these things. And that kind of leads me to telling my own story about uh, my connection to this show, because it's it's 100 percent because of Paul, because. I did watch some episodes of it during high school, but mostly my memory of it is my friends would get stoned and want to watch animated shows, and Batman the Animated Series was the thing we watched while I was waiting for us to watch Darkwing Duck, uh, which, you know... <laughs> so thematically and, and like, all of a piece. Yeah, yeah. very much so. I, you know, a lot of Darkwing engines. Duck having the, the far better theme song, I will say. Um but I never – it was the thing that my friends liked to laugh at when they were stoned. And, you know, it was like, it's fine, but I never really took it very seriously. And then when Paul and I were having all these great conversations that like, – the, the conversations that would eventually lead to this podcast um, about Batman and stuff, Paul would keep mentioning, you know, Batman the animated series. And I was like, no, but it's animated. I'm not going to like it. I'm not going to get into it. And when I finally sat down and really watched it, of course, I discovered what so many others have, that it's – brilliant storytelling and has some of the joy of animated shows to be sure but is i mean there's a lot of animation especially now that isn't like just for kids but especially back then it was kind of unique uh particularly something that came out you know weekday afternoons and i think it was kevin so much of that uh you know for all the things we're talking about and as i was trying to kind of put my arms around like what it was that made his influence so powerful the thing that I kept coming back to, and I want to kind of let each of us talk about maybe one thing about Kevin, Kevin Conroy's performance that we really spoke to them. It's for me, it's the way he interacts with the villains, especially the ones who he has some sympathy for. Um, I think there's a lot of opinions of Batman and a lot of portrayals of him that is the, you know, he, he is vengeance. He is the knight. He's the one who's going to punish the bad guys and make them fearful. And I think there's a lot of that even with Kevin Conroy. But some of my favorite episodes are the one where he's with Grundy or with Ace, who uh, Paul, oh, you maybe have more to say on that yeah. that episode, yeah. um, or with Harley. You know, like Harley's bad day, where it's so clear that he both wants to stop the person doing the bad thing, but he recognizes like this person also had some major trauma, just like he did. And maybe it's not just because Bruce is a better person that Bruce went one way and they went another, but that there's. A lot of ways that Bruce could have maybe gone their way or they could have gone his way. And he has a sympathy for them. And I just – I've never seen a, a, a portrayal of Batman that expresses that sympathy uh, the way Kevin Conroy did. Yeah, I'm trying to think whether whether I've seen that that much in other Batmans or I've seen that so much in this Batman that it's mm-hmm. just like how I view Batman, you know? Yeah. But, like, like a lot of other Batmans, I think it's – if it's a pretty woman who he's supposed to be flirting with, then he can have some sympathy for her. Um, but like, you know, Penguin and, and Catwoman both have kind of sympathetic backstories. Uh, we care a lot about Catwomans, not Penguins in the, the Batman Forever movie. Right. I think, you- I mean, he does have the benefit that it is a TV show. And so he, he has so much more room for those moments. Like you don't have room for that mm-hmm. in two hours or three hours as <laughs> we've been getting lately. Um but you do have room for that in 24, 22 minute episodes. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's partially the format, but I think, yeah, I mean, he, so many people, I've seen so many people over the years say Batman, the animated series is Batman is the best Batman. And it's because he has that humanity. He has that warmth. And I, I mean, we keep coming back to Christian Bale who, when he's Batman, it's just like incoherent growling. Like you lose, he's so good at Bruce Wayne and you lose the humanity once he becomes Batman. And that's, I mean, that's the case with a lot of these performers, but you never lose it with Kevin Conroy. You always Mm -hmm. have that, the feeling that like, as Paul was saying, there's a person in there. Um, And I, um, 
I was actually rereading. So uh, earlier this year, DC published um, a Pride anthology, which they've done for a few years now. And Kevin Conroy actually wrote a story for it. Um, and yeah. usually these are like superhero, like it, they're superhero comics. It's about like queer characters in the comics, but this was an autobiographical story. And it's amazing. It's, it's the best story in the anthology and DC has actually made it free to read. Um, so I That's highly right. recommend going and checking that out. Um, but when he talks about s- using the Batman voice for the first time, he frames it very much as coming from a place of real human pain and not, it's not there to frighten. It's, it's a cry from the heart. And I think mm. that again, that, that understanding that Batman is a manifestation of, of pain and not being badass. I mean, he's very badass when he wants to be, but, mm-hmm. but it's not like an part. affectation. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. I, I like that a lot because that is so – in many ways, I think Chris, Michael Keaton was the Batman I saw as a kid and sort of shaped the aesthetic for me. But the Batman who really kind of shaped a lot of my initial ideas of Batman was Christian Bale. And that's where it's very much the sort of ideas that Ra's al Ghul – very much the ideas that Ra's al Ghul teaches him of like, you know, use fear as a weapon, you know, and, and all that. And so I, I really like that different take on it. Yeah. I, I will say just in terms of the Christian Bale Batman, I think in Batman Begins, he had a, a really nice difference between Bruce Wayne and, and Batman. And then in The Dark Knight, he just like – doubled down on the like <laughs> really super growly and like yeah and also like the audio mixing just was just a the the bad thing about that movie yeah. but like yeah, yeah i think um it wasn't not just but, but, growling there was like a voice modulator in the <laughs> yeah it was it was just way too much and it but i but i agree that it, it was it was also motivated differently right it was it came from a different part of the character or it, it really showed a, a different take on the character even though you know it's like well yeah here's the batman voice here's the bruce wayne voice it's like okay but you know his bruce wayne voice was almost always not almost always but like had a very much of like a he was putting on an air and then his batman voice was also like he was putting on a different air so i think with the christian bale batman we very rarely got that really genuine person that that yeah. we got from yeah. kevin conroy I think it's very true. So what about from each of you? What's kind of like one thing about Kevin Conroy's performance that you want to lift up? Or it could be like a specific aspect or like a particular episode or moment. I just have a bunch of lines. <laughs> <laughs> sure, if you want to kind of rattle through some of them. Is there going to be a separate segment where we're talking about favorite moments or? Uh, well, I don't want this to go too long. So this is kind of like going to be the wrap-up segment. So yeah, if you want to go for it now. <clears throat> okay. So, so I'll just I'll just list a bunch of. First of all, you mentioned the epilogue episode of the Justice League Unlimited. Um, whether it's season two or three, it's like they had a total of thirty nine episodes. This is the twenty sixth episode. It's the end of this whole Cadmus arc, right? Which was actually the reason that I wanted you to watch the Justice League because it like it gets into like you know real world issues through the lens yeah. of like superheroes right and um it was kind of like you know civil war before civil war and it's um you know i, I there's so many great lines throughout that whole arc um where you know early on there's like they're fighting all these nanobots and and Batman's in the Batwing and the Batwing gets destroyed by the nanobots and he bails out, but he like doesn't have a parachute. And yes, he's like, yes. uh, he's like, if somebody could catch me, I can't fly at all. <laughs> and just the deli- – like that's one of my favorite lines. And He's so it's, unflappable yeah. when he says it. He's like, well, I'm <laughs> going to die, but I'm not going to get worked up over it. <laughs> exactly. It's just like so matter of fact, but also such a dramatic moment, right? And then I think Wonder Woman saves him. Um, and uh, there's another – I mean the whole – Batman and Wonder Woman dynamic throughout the Justice League series, I think is just fantastic. And there's, there's, there's so many moments. Um, there's one time when they're, they're hiding, but in, in person. So he's, you know, Bruce Wayne and, and she's Diana, I guess. And, um, she kisses him to like, you know, sort of, so somebody doesn't 
notice that mm-hmm. they're who they are. And she's like, you know, I'm sorry. And he's like, don't be. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like the way he says it, just it's, it's just <laughs> – it's so different from what we saw in the rest of the Justice League because we don't get much Bruce in the Justice League, right? It's mostly Batman I, there. I don't get too much into like romantic pairings of different characters, but one of the ones I am fairly diehard for is Bruce Diana. And I yeah. so much of it is because of his interact, like that Kevin Conroy's interactions with her. And it just like, nope. Any, any of the pairing for either of them? Nope. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I, I feel you on that. Um, and then entirely because of the Justice League series. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and then later in in the um, the Cadmus arc, there's there's a spot where he's talking to um, Amanda Waller, um, portrayed fantastically by uh, CCH Pounder, right? And mm-hmm. um, and he's talking about Lex, you know, not just wanting to be president, and she's like, she's like, he wants to be president. That's enough power for anyone, and he's just like almost anyone (laughs) and it's like it's a great line and it's just delivered perfectly you know and that whole episode there's like a thing where they're they all the justice league wants to like turn themselves into the government and he's like he's just like you know he's like if if you're you know whatever like clear your own name don't sit on the sidelines and wait for someone else to do it and they're like well you have to you know we voted you have to come along he's like i'm just a part-timer remember batman out Yeah, some of the best stuff of his, we've talked most about the animated series, but in the Justice League, the way he's able to portray that he's sort of like, he's on the same side, but not the same team of the Justice League. Right. He's going to show up, but yeah. he's not, but he he's never going to drink the Kool-Aid. It's like, you still like him? Like, when he does that in the comics, I'm like, shut up, then leave. <laughs> I don't need you. But like, <laughs> Kevin Conroy's Batman, I'm like, all right. You knucklehead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it just works within the, the context of the show, you know, and yeah. because it's it's delivered like, I don't know, when you're reading a comic, you can kind of, I mean, maybe you hear Kevin Conroy's voice when you read Batman, you know, I'm I'm sure I do. But, it, you know, it depends on how it's written. Sometimes it's written in a way where it's like, oh, this, no, <laughs> this isn't, you know, this isn't that Batman. And, um you know, but when when you when you see an animated show, you're you're hearing the voice, right? And yeah. how the line is delivered can make such a difference in terms of uh, how the line is felt. And um, I guess I'll just, in terms of uh, th- these lines, there's the entire epilogue episode of of the Justice League Unlimited series, which is just like. I kind of don't want to go over the whole thing again. I I basically narrated the episode to my mom the other night on the phone while like mm. walking out in the cold and <laughs> at night. It felt appropriate. Um and like I was like tearing up. You know, it's like hard to actually explain like everything that happens in the episode cuz and then basically it's just, you know, this super villain is like doing super villain stuff, but she's about to have an aneurysm and you know, Amanda Waller is like, well, I need you to go in and she'll trust you and, and then go ahead and kill her. And he's like, yeah, OK, I'll do that. Uh, but like he has no intention of doing that, you know, and he ends up just like asking her, like, could you know, could you could you stop it <laughs> Like with the, you know, and like she does, you know, and I think because, you know, they have a they have a real connection there in that moment. And, you know, and she asks if he'll like stay with her and he does. And he like yeah. holds her hand sitting on a swing you know, important to this, I think, is that like not only is she a super villain, she's also like what a ten. She's a girl, kid. Yeah, girl. I don't know how yeah. old she actually is, but yeah, she's a kid. You know, and and she's like, you know, basically she had this power, and and Cadmus or some governmental agency tried to turn her into a weapon, and she's like, they got their weapon. You know, I got robbed of my childhood. And then, you know, Batman's like, I I know what that's like, and she's like, you do, don't you? Because you know, she can read minds, and. Like, you know, and then they're just sitting there on swings, you know, so it's like she, you know, they're kind of like two kids, you know, where it's like a part of Bruce is always that eight year old boy who just saw his parents murdered. And um, it's it's just a, a beautiful moment and terribly sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, like every line that you've said, I mean, it's been years since I watched Justice League. That's why, like, I started this, you know. DCAU rewatch, but I'm still in season one of Batman because it's 65 episodes long. (laughs) So many Um, episodes. 
but every single line you've said, I like, I can remember exactly the cadence or exactly yeah. how he said it. Like, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Like engraved yeah. on my brain. Yeah. It's their iconic lines delivered iconically. Like mm-hmm. it just, and it, the way he does it, I think it feels effortless, you know, which isn't to say that it was, but yeah. sometimes someone's like giving some big impassioned speech and it feels like, it feels like acting, you know, and mm-hmm. granted, we've already talked about sometimes the character is acting and he gets that across as well, but it just, it, I mean, I, I think great acting is like, when you it doesn't feel like acting it just feels like the person there's a person there and you you feel how they think and and how they feel and it just it just all comes across yeah one one just take quick thing that also makes me think of in terms of just the the acting range is batman beyond oh which, yes where mm-hmm. kevin is now now playing yeah. The same character, but a just thirty years older, which changes the voice. But also, it's a it's a more cynical Batman in some ways. It's a yeah. Batman who has really kind of like lost some of his like under like he who's really kind of suffering under the weight of everything he's been dealing with, and is slowly brought back to an understanding by this younger version of himself. Um, and it's just it's just an amazing like I was definitely very shocked when I realized it was the same voice actor. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? It just is. Like, it's very tied to it, but it's just, like, just for that vocal talent, I wouldn't have thought of it. Yeah. Uh, just what about, what about from you? One kind of, either a couple favorite moments or lines or just one last aspect of the portrayal? I mean, we we definitely hit a bunch of them. The scene in Mask of the Phantasm, the, um, Paul had a few of them, the all of, all of epilogue. <laughs> um, the bit in, um, when he says to Harley, I had a bad day too, like, so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. But my number one, and I remember the very first time, like I remember when this episode aired, is the uh, JLU episode in the first season, This Little Picky, um, oh, when he yes. sings. Oh, because, wow. Because uh, Wonder Woman has been transformed into a pig by Cersei, and the <laughs> only way that he can get her to tur- like turn back into herself is by singing in Cersei's nightclub, and... Like, I, again, I remember when this episode aired and I remember everybody losing their minds because we didn't know Kevin Conroy could sing. And he has a beautiful singing voice. And like, of course, yeah. this, like I'm the musical theater person. Like, of course, I lost my mind at this. But it was just and like the minute he started singing, it was like, well, of course, Batman would have a beautiful singing voice. He trained to be the best at everything. <laughs> like, right, the right. minute he did it, yeah. it made sense and it was logical. And it's just like, l- literally, I will sometimes just pull up that clip and listen to it, even though it's like 30 seconds of a song and not the full thing. And I wish mm-hmm. they recorded the full thing. Oh, that would be gorgeous. so good. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that, that scene, that whole episode is amazing. It's so good. That whole, The so first good. season of that, sh- uh, well, no, the whole show. All of these shows are good. I think that's yeah. the moral of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it also lets me tie into what – I'm the host. I get to do this. I'll do the one last thing again. Um, but, like, you were talking, Paul, about him talking to um, Amanda Waller. And, and th- to me, that's one of the best things in the Justice League uh, show shows is that I think a big part of why I am – Amanda Waller is one of my favorite characters in animation and why – to some extent, I agree with her some of the time is because to some extent, Batman agrees with her. And mm. I've never seen that anywhere except in those animated shows where sometimes like the two of them are the ones who are like, yeah, this Superman guy who's always going to be good and right. We can have no limitations on because he'll always do the right thing. Do you buy it? No. Do you buy it? No. Like just the way that they connect sometimes is... Even though often they're working across purposes, but they still like they're both having that suspicion. And I just, I, his Kevin Conroy's acting in that is a lot of why. It, like, I think it's sort of like if Batman can see some val- validity in her point of view, so can I. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole thing where he's like, they're right to be afraid of us, you know. And, yeah. And you know, Superman's like trying to make a joke. He's like, I took a bullet for you, Clark, or whatever. Like, he literally <laughs> just like attached the bat wing to like a nuclear weapon or something. I don't know. Like, somehow didn't quite totally get blown up. Makes sense. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you both so much. This has always been uh, it's a mini episode, and we are going to be under 35 minutes or so. But I'm so glad both of you could be a part of this. Uh, Jess, you've mentioned a couple things you're doing. We're going to have links in the show notes to the obituary that you're writing, as well as to that you've already written. We're going to have links in the show notes to the obituary, uh, Kevin, that you wrote, as well as I'm going to have a link to that um, comic that you mentioned that Kevin wrote. Uh, but is there anyone else else? Is there anything else people should know about what you're doing these days? Um, yeah, it's pretty much all over on Book Riot. Um, uh, technically, I'm at Jess Plummer on Twitter, but who knows if Twitter will still be standing by the time this airs. Um, so yeah, I'd stick with Book Riot. Great. I'll also say that um, Jess and I will be having uh, another conversation in about 10 minutes, so you'll probably hear it before you hear this, on another part of the DC universe that is just so awash with deep ethical questions and brilliant portrayals, and I wish you could see the sarcasm on my face because I'm talking about Black Adam. <laughs> so if you want to hear us talk about Black Adam, maybe a little less tears, but, but have still some great things to say, check that out also on this podcast. Uh, Paul, the Zen Madman is still hibernating in the Zen cave, doing Zen poker things, and will be emerging like a butterfly in January with new content? Something like that, yes. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I am literally so, sitting in a, in a dark room with all the lights out and podcasting, which I don't know. It, it feels <laughs> like very both Batman very Batman and, and also like very voice actor, you know? So I, I feel a deep connection right now, too. Yeah, um, I like it. Yeah. I like it. All right. Well, thank you both so much to all of our audience. Would love to hear from you. Um, it's always true, but especially this. What are some of your favorite Kevin Conroy moments? Are there episodes that you've been like inspired to go back and watch? Are you? I mean, it, this is a show we're talking about that was mostly big in the '90s and early 2000s. I, I'm guessing there's some of you who maybe haven't seen it or haven't seen many of his portrayals. Uh, what's your take on this? How, how does his portrayal compare to others? Or what have you heard about it before? Anything you want to tell us, go to theethicalpanda.com, send us your thoughts, send us your ideas. You can find us on Facebook, email, Twitter, all the different places that people are. Well, Twitter may be in a little while. Who knows? But certainly you can email us, find us on Facebook, anything you want. On behalf of myself, Paul, Jessica, thank you so much. Uh, and in honor of Kevin Conroy, thank you to all of you for um, listening in. And I just, you know, thank you to Kevin for all the amazing content uh, he gave us. Thank you all, and have a good night. And second, the voice kept calling me Bruce in my mind. That's not what I call myself. <laughs>